the what became the Robin Hood Company was actually organized in 1896 in Canada uh, by a gentleman named Edward Dixon uh, and a hardware uh, shop guy in uh, in Winnipeg named James Ashton. Uh, they wanted to form a conglomerate, and they uh, they had uh, the powder uh, made at a very primitive facility here in Swanton. But uh, it really didn't get started until uh, about 1898 as the Robin Hood Powder Company. It was incorporated then legally uh, in January 8th of 1900. And so at that point, uh, we really started having a Swanton um, experience. So let me make sure that this is on. Okay, so this is Canada Street in Swanton, about 1917. This will give you a bit of a feeling for what the uh, what the area was like. Uh, my grandfather's house uh, and where I live today is right here. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, so this is just looking down the Merchants Row. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Swanton has this little fountain right here. Uh, and my dad remembers that that was uh, originally set so that you could water your horses uh, right there at the junction between Canada and Spring. Um, in the 1930s, it was taken apart, and now it's over in the Riverside Cemetery, just as a uh, as a piece of uh, of lawn sculpture. We should all think about getting it back and getting it running there. Now, uh, as I said. Uh, originally, the Robin Hood had a very small plant. Now, this one here is called the Powder Farm. This is the original plant that was built down on the Guam Shore Road, about two thirds of the way uh, down toward the Guam Shore from Swanton. It was a very interesting structure uh, because, of course, they had to grind the materials and mix the materials to make the powder. And so it was. Uh, powered with a, uh, a steam engine right in here, uh, and this held the water. And you see this line? That's actually a big belt. Uh, and so the belt comes out, loops around, and then uh, you see this is a big axle that goes between these. So you had individual small rooms here where you could actually make the power. Now, why do you think these uh, buildings? We're all uh, separated from the, uh, the steam engine <laughs> and from each other. Okay. And uh, they did. I'm going to tell you some stories about various explosions that happened, uh, that happened here. But this was the first plant. Uh, it started basically in 1898. And uh, they did not make uh, any forms of cartridges on the shotgun shell or anything. They were basically making powder. Most of it at this point was exported up to Canada. They also early on had a auxiliary organization up in uh, St. John, Quebec as well. So one of the interesting things is there was a very large Canadian uh, kind of influence in this at first. Now this is an early uh, Robin Hood Powder Company, 12 gauge uh, shot shell. The early, remember I said that early on they, all they did was make power. Okay. So what they did is they bought uh, the casing from England. Okay, they had stamped and everything. Now one of the ways you can tell these really early ones if you're interested in collecting uh, these things is if you'll notice uh, underneath the Robin Hood there is nothing. The American made ones had an error. Okay? So those of you that you know, if you have a collection of these or have any interest, that's one of the ways you can tell. These early shot shells that came from Britain, they were 10 gauge and 12 gauge, no 20 gauge. Okay. Now these little um, buildings here, as soon as they started making the gunpowder, uh, excuse me, the cartridges, uh, not only did they have to make the powder, but they had to make the primers. Now, 
Early primers were made with a material called fulminate of mercury. Now, fulminate of mercury is exceedingly, exceedingly unstable. And uh, so uh, they had to build another building at the old powder barn uh, at a distance away from this. And uh, the components of the fulminate had to be shipped in a barrel uh, full of water, and then you suspended it inside this barrel uh, in a bag. Okay? Uh, so it was surrounded on all sides by, by water, and that's how you shipped it. Uh, because once it dried out, or started to dry out, it was not managed properly in terms of the temperature and things, it would be highly unstable. And, and then, uh, this is what would happen. Okay? Uh, a, I'm going to tell you a little story later with Joe Hilliker about one of the experimental uh, explosions. But that was later. But this is one of the early buildings here. You notice there's no fire? There's nothing. Because the fulminate, when it lets go, it converts uh, a, about that much uh, you know, uh, fulminate mercury into about 12 square feet of gas. Okay? So that's called a detonation. It doesn't burn. So it's just a huge pressure wave that comes out. So it's just uh, basically like a tornado knocked it all out. And uh, interesting, these usually didn't kill people unless they hit the wall. You know, they would just pick them up and blow them 100 yards. Uh, and there's interesting stories that are associated with people who survived. OK, then in 1900, uh, after they started making uh, not only powder, but more and more uh, shotgun shells, they built a much larger uh, building down on the shores of the Missisquoi River. And this is uh, it in 1907. So this is the bridge uh, going across. Okay, and so this is, uh, this is the Robin Hood right here. This was set up so they could take advantage of, uh, of the power of the Sisquai River instead of having to have a steam engine. So that would cut down on the danger of fly ash or, uh, or things come from the coal coming out of the, uh, the smokestack and the landing. Okay, so uh, this is very, very important. And that's where my dad worked, my grandfather. Now, he was hired in 19, uh, 1901. And uh, he was hired as a tool and guy. Um, and he worked for the uh, uh, Diamond Match Company before moving, uh, moving over here. And so um, he was hired as a tool and die maker. And he is the one that actually made many of the head stamps. Uh, it said Robin Hood or R or something like that. He made those. It's uh, an immense uh, skill, uh, form of, uh, a very complex form of, uh, of sculpture to be able to do that. And I still have some of uh, the head stamps. Yeah, so I can kind of fit. <laughs> Any number of them if you want. Uh, some interesting things uh, that, were, that were important is that uh, lots of windows, because uh, they wanted to, uh, of course, at this time, electricity, so electric was just uh, being started. Uh, and so they wanted to have as much natural light in there, so they didn't have to have either the chance of a short and the very crude knob and tube kind of electrical wiring that they had, uh, or with any form of a lamp. And so um, there was a one smokestack way in the back. This is the, uh, the forge. Uh, this is where the, uh, the dyes were uh, heat treated. OK, that's the only fire that they had in there. This is a picture my grandfather took with his, uh, his bicycle. He used to get up every morning at 5 o'clock and be at work at 6. Okay. Um, and so that's what it looks like. You can see it was uh, the number of windows everywhere. You just wanted to get as much light in there as, uh, as you possibly could. That's some uh, five stories at the top and everything. This is what it looked like inside. Okay, so you see that uh, all the machines here ran off of a long uh, kind of shaft that connected to a water wheel. 
And so these are the, uh, the different die, uh, die press types of pools and stuff like that. Uh, my grandfather took this picture. Uh, Oren Batchelder, uh, a historian in Swanton, uh, got it. He did the typing right here. But this is where my grandfather worked. That was his, his station right there. And uh, how, how you work these machines is that uh, you let this, uh, this shaft on the top turn continuously. And what you did is you tightened up the belt with a little uh, lever like this. Once it tightened up the belt, then this thing would choo, 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 and start uh, doing the, you know, the processes was necessary. Okay? Uh, so this is where all the, uh, by this time they were rolling their own uh, cardboard and they were stamping their own head stamps and the, uh, all the brass. Uh, and, and they were also making the primer exteriors. All of the powder work was still done at the powder work. Okay? Now you didn't have any gunpowder uh, in here. Except uh, there was one area in the back here on, on that side that you notice there's no machines in there. And you can see there's some vents and stuff like that. This is where a lot of experimental mixes with powder were done. And then they would be fired in these uh, little crucibles. And uh, they also had, oh, I wish I, I had one of these. It's highly collectible. It's a little mortar. And it was taken outside and had a 12 pound slug. And you put a uh, quarter ounce of powder in it. And then you stand back like this kind of boom. And depending on how powerful it is, the, uh, the slug would go up uh, so high. But it was like a little mortar piece, straight up. And uh, you know, they're highly, highly valuable, but I doubt any people know what the heck it is. It doesn't look like anything like a cannon, but gun collectors just love these things. But that was out in the back, too. So that's a, this uh, section in the back, and uh, right here, that's the only place where there was any real amount of powder. powder. Now, let's talk a little bit about what they made. Um, Robin Hood Powder Company, as I said, this is the earliest iteration, the earliest form of the, uh, the Robin Hood. Most of what they were making were black and smokeless powder. Okay. Uh, one of the things that they really founded the company on was the manufacture smokeless powder. Uh, and there, there were a couple of guys when, when it was first coming out in 1900, people were scared of smokeless powder uh, because they, they thought that it would burn uh, too hot, too fast, and be too uh, damaging on various types of, uh, of gun barrels. For example, uh, during the time period, there was a very fancy kind of a shotgun barrel called the Damascus barrel that instead of just being a tube of steel, it was actually uh, some steel, basically some thick wires that were coiled together, forged, coiled together again, forged, and then made into a coil. And then the whole thing was rigged out and, uh, and welded together. Okay? Now that works fine with uh, the relatively low uh, pressure of the detonation of the uh, black powder. But every now and then, uh, if you did mix your smokeless powder exactly right, the, the uh, flaws that were in that multiple uh, castings and forgings and reforgings and forgings, those were let go and people were killed. So people were really scared of it. So one of the things they really had to come out with was uh, try to figure out how to make this powder, this smokeless powder, which was nitrocellulose, mix it with some other things, to make it burn progressively instead of detonating. Okay, detonate turns from solid to gas instantly. So uh, this is one of the big things that Robin but really was one of the pioneers uh, to actually work this out. That's why they had that little uh, get that little mortar that would shoot up and they wanted to get the biggest bang for the lowest pressure. So uh, that's what they did for smokeless powder, but they also uh, quickly learned that they needed to sell black as well. Now, interestingly enough, Black powder is much more dangerous to make than smokeless powder. Uh, but they had to uh, try to make that, but then eventually they decided not to, and they actually just bought it from other vendors, uh, such as DuPont. 
They also got into uh, making the first of the cartridges. This is a 22 rimfire cartridge. This is a, a very small, well, I'm not sure everybody knows what a 22 is. Uh, they had uh, 22 short and long, long rifles were not uh, being made yet. So this is some of the, uh, the products. It's familiar. Okay. Yeah, it's really weird. Every one of these powder cans that I've seen is completely cracked. Yours is cracked too, isn't it? Same made. Yep. Exactly the same thing. So this is my little one. Uh, so this is Robin Hood, uh, Robin Hood powder. Okay, this is where you check. It's one in Vermont. Okay, this is a picture of Robin Hood. Unfortunately, you can't see him very well. Yet. But, um, so this had on the back of it, it would have like a variety of powders with a paper label on it. These very early ones. Okay? If anybody has a question or comment, you can just make it and I'll deal with it now right at the very end. Okay? Any questions? Yes, sir. I wondered why they called it the Robin Hood powder. How did they get the name? Schmidt is an error. Pardon? Schmidt is an error. Uh -huh. I'm going to show you some of their logos and stuff like that later. Okay. Yep. Okay, this is uh, an interesting example of one of the powder cans. Now, I've got a little story about this. Uh, a friend of my father's, Warren Bachelor, now uh, he had the watch shop in Swanton. Uh, for a long time. Uh, he was the Swan's historian back when I was a kid. And uh, he said that there's a, a rumor about a room in the Robin Hood uh, that had, uh, had never been opened, so there might be something interesting in it. Since I was the uh, grandson of the, uh, the last person who was in charge of the Robin Hood, we decided to go, how should I say, explore? <laughs> We found a whole, uh, this room had a pile of these. I don't know, 150, 200 of them. All brand new, uh, wrapped still in the paper. Now, I got two of them, uh, and I don't know really what ever happened with the rest of them, but uh, if you go on eBay, even today, you can see uh, these powder cans in just about mint condition, still wrapped with their paper. So those are all out in the trade now. But that was a great discovery. I was just happy to get two of them. But that's what it was like back in the 50s. A high adventure. So this is their manufacturing uh, about 1905 or so here. So you see less recoil. So that's one of the things about progressive power instead of bam, bam, like that. And so these are all the different loads. I don't think you really are that interested in it, but they added a whole series, and interestingly enough, uh, Robin Hood uh, made scores of different uh, types of powder. All of them are a little bit, uh, a little bit different. Now, in this, they made both high brass, see this? That's called a high brass shot shell. They added a lot of powder down in here, and then a little bit less was in what we call the low brass. So that's what uh, we're talking about right here. So if you collect these uh, different drama of things, you can make a collection that will fill up this whole wall with different uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, Robin Hood is really strange. It was one of the few companies that had so many different brands at this time. If you look at DuPont, it had five. And uh, this is amazing. So they had all these different types of uh, rapid eye gets and different types of, uh, of powder. This is very dense one. This would be used on high brass, this bulk smokeless powder. That's a variety of powder that was specifically designed so it could be used with a measure for hand loading. Okay, if you hand measure uh, this dense uh, powder, you wouldn't be able to get the, the charge right when you pull yourself up. Uh, so that's what they talk about with bulk. Uh, that is exactly the, uh, the same volume as a black powder. So if you want to fill up a 30-30 cartridge, you can know exactly how to fill it with that you know, some of those powder. So these are some of the, uh, the products here. So there you can see Robin Hood a little bit better. Okay. Bone gauge. So this is the Robin Hood brand itself.
Now, it, uh, Robin Hood decided to, oh, yes, one, the reason why this, uh, the Robin Hood powder changed uh, to Robin Hood Ammunition Company. On September, September 18th, 1905, um, Arthur Bean was killed. Now, uh, he's actually a relative of mine. Uh, Robin had a program of quality control, and they would test uh, the, you know, all the different powders and stuff like that, actually in shotguns. And if so, such a percentage was found faulty for any reason at all, uh, that particular lot was recycled. It wasn't scrapped. Later on, they started scrapping because when they it. Okay, so what they had in the corner of that building, I showed you up on the back side there, there was a deluding machine. And this was a gadget where you put a, uh, a cartridge into it or a shot shell, and it penetrated and pulled it apart so that you could empty out the shot. Uh, and then a thing where you could remove the wallet and you could take out the powder to recycle. Okay, well, Arthur Bean was using this machine uh, and it's unclear exactly what happened, but the, uh, uh, the primer let go, shot right up uh, into him, uh, and there was powder that was in a big container uh, right next to him, and the whole thing let go. Uh, Arthur Bean was, uh, was killed, and two others were injured, and a large section of that building was, uh, was taken out by that. Uh, they had to rebuild it, and uh, because of some other organizational things, uh, and the fact that they had decided to now start manufacturing metallic cartridges, they changed from Robin Hood powder company that had previously been focused to Robin Hood ammunition. Okay? So once again, uh, they're still at the same building. Just imagine, uh, you know, a lot of smoke and everything we have now back in this corner. Uh, now, you'll notice. Yes, they're still doing the shot shells. They're still making the powder down at the powder bar. Okay? Get the loading, all of these. Once again, they saw the room fire. But now they started getting into center fire cartridges. So, uh, two of the most important at the time uh, were for pistols. And these were used by police departments all throughout uh, the United States. And, uh, and Canada. And so the two most important were 32 and 44 caliber Smith, Smith and Wesson. Uh, these were generally used uh, by detectives. Uh, and the 44, uh, this was uh, generally for either uh, the United States uh, Army uh, and their cult, uh, or the uh, Smith and Wessons, or uh, things like border, uh, precursor border patrol. Uh, Texas Rangers and stuff like that. So this one here, 32 is designed to uh, slow you down. Uh, 44 is designed to stop you. Well, they had uh, a huge success, and they started sent, uh, selling huge numbers of cartridges, uh, shot shells, and cartridges all over the United States, Canada, uh, and even uh, export into Mexico. And so they decided to build a big factory. And so uh, the new factory uh, set out uh, on the uh, Cardinal Directions here uh, was built in 1909. And it was uh, as new, as, uh, as modern a factory as you could, uh, you could think about. So it had two train lines that came into it that could supply it. Uh, this is it had a big uh, factory uh, steam engines here that powered everything uh, in the buildings. This wing here was, uh, was where my grandfather worked. That was his office right there. Okay. That's where all the design uh, and development was done. Yes, sir. Where was it? Uh, okay, this is uh, Let's see, uh, Route 78 goes right this way, the interstate would be right over here. Okay, the shopping center in Swanton would be 
right down here. So if you go to the uh, shopping center and respond in, uh, you'll see right across the street there's a thing called Robin Hood Drive. Once you see that, drive down it, and at the left there's going to be these great uh, big kind of granite-ish looking uh, cement buildings. That's it. Still, still there, still there. Okay? But this is what it first looked like when it was built. Now, uh, see these in here? Guess what those are? Fulminate buildings. Okay? Uh, these, these things here, see these little um, boxes are sticking up? Uh, these are the power hoppers uh, for loading the shot shots. And those were pretty uh, dangerous too. So there's all kinds of interesting stories. This is the rifle range here. Uh, the elementary school, the middle school is up here. Now, uh, back in the 1960s, yes? Can you explain the difference between center fire and rim fire? <clears throat> okay, a, uh, a cartridge has to have the primer, primer material in it to fulminate. And there's two different places that you can put it. A rim fire actually has a little flange around the outside of the bottom of it. And uh, there's very, this uh, machine that can push the, uh, the fulminate into that ring right there. And so when, it's, uh, when the cartridge is loaded in, and that ring actually comes dead up against a piece of steel, the, uh, the firing pin then goes up against that, and that's how it uh, knocks it. That's a 22. All 22s are what we call ring fire. A center fire actually has uh, a, uh, the fulminate is in a special gadget in the middle. I call it primer, it used to be called a cap. And those are, uh, after it's shot, um, you can knock that primer out and reload it. The rim fire you can't reload. So uh, that's why they're called rim and center fire. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Um, I was lucky enough um, to do some work. This is my drawing. I went there with, um, with Frank Barrett. Um, I worked for my grandfather a couple of years before he passed away. Uh, that's far up for it. Okay. And uh, Judd Hillard, uh, the embassy of uh, the Florida Band Lines. Okay. Uh, the people who worked for my grandfather did very well afterwards. Uh, and he took me around and we made this, uh, this drawing here. So this is uh, when I was just a, just a kid. Okay. So this gives you uh, the position of uh, where everything was. So there's a fallen name rooms out here. So I'm very glad that uh, you know, I was able to interview these people. I was just a kid. You know how much we always regret uh, if I only knew then what I know now, what I could have done? Well, thank goodness, you know, I was a geek about this stuff when I was a kid. And so uh, I was able to get this and then uh, we were able to label all the different parts of it later. Oh yeah. So let's back up. All right. Now this is, this takes place, I can't remember, I think it's the far end, uh, fulminate room. The, this is my grandfather here. Uh, this is Judd Hilliker. Uh, they're out um, hunting. I guess those are squirrels there. And that's Bill Borden. Okay? So this is Judd Hilliker's story. So um, he was one of the inspectors. And he had to do a round. He was almost like a watchman. He had to do a round continuously. He to place to place to place. Make sure no, uh, nobody was falling asleep and everybody was awake. And, you know, keeping up with what they had to do. Uh, he really wasn't a big boss, but he was just there to make sure that uh, people were on task. Okay? So he was, uh, was going into the culminate room, and uh, there was, there was uh, Ned Aiken's father, uh, Mr. Aiken, uh, was working uh, in, in there, 
and uh, he was working on something over here, and there was a, uh, a container this big, a fulminate. And Judd looked over there, and uh, it was supposed to be kept wet, it had to be kept in a very specific uh, amount of humidity. And he looked over, and the fulminate was starting to move. And, uh, and Judd said, look out. Uh, and then he grabbed the guy, uh, pulled him through the door, and they started running and, uh, away from the building. And Judd said, it was almost as if the hand of God uh, had picked me up uh, very gently and threw me about 40 yards straight forward. He said, my feet came off the ground and I was in, in the air. So I didn't fall over. Uh, I landed on my knees. Okay? Uh, and they were both safe. They turned around and the building wasn't there. I mean, it wasn't just blown apart like that other one I showed you. It was gone. No fire, no nothing. So that's a dollar for story. So those are, that's why I give, talk, uh, give the name of this talk about the, you know, the many explosions in, in Swanton at the time. Okay, so here we are with uh, probably about 1910, uh, 1912, something like that. So don't kill you to shoot, they shoot to kill. They have all kinds of really interesting little uh, ditties that go along with the other type. But the idea that all of it, uh, it should have been William Tell, right? But you see, it doesn't kill you to shoot. They were really uh, excited about uh, their varieties of sporting powder that did not bend it then they really have that and give you a, a sort of shoulder when you're firing. And it was supposed to be the big selling point. Of course, uh, everybody, uh, DuPont and Remington, everybody, uh, got a hold of their stuff and reverse engineered it. And by 1915, everybody had the progressive uh, powders. So, once again, uh, these are all the different types and brands of shotgun shells, same as we saw before. But you'll notice down here, we've got other varieties as well. So they've got uh, you know, 20 gauge now. They had uh, 14 gauge. I've never seen a 14 gauge shotgun. Okay, 12, uh, 12, and then 10 gauge. 10 gauge was very useful. Uh, it was used a lot for goose hunting. Okay. We get a lot of shot when we have one of those things. And uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever shot a 10 gauge, but uh, my all accounts are pretty good. And that's why my Robin Hood is so proud of his progressive burn and its power. Okay. So here's some of the, uh, the boxes. That's how nice and colorful they are. So these are capital, and they would tell you what is much power. Uh, they were loaded with because that was the idea is their powders were very special and they were advertised in the vendors. Oh my god, I can have a cartridge loaded with peerless powder. Clipper. Okay. Loaded with peerless powder. Eclipse. Eclipse near smokeless powder. Now this was a variety of basically smokeless powder that still smoked, but it was uh, very gentle uh, on your shoulder. That's how they call it near smoke. Uh, it had some material in it, but one of the things is you, in the old days, you always had to uh, clean your gun after every use of, uh, of black powder because the nitrates and things like that that would be uh, remaining in the barrel when you rode uh, the barrel. Smoke is powder you didn't have to. This was a near smokeless powder that you didn't have to clean afterwards. I hate to tell you some of the uh, stories that the old time was just to tell about what made uh, for good uh, material to uh, clean your gun barrels out when you're out in the middle of the woods and you didn't have any place to go. But you had some place to go and you could and we use it for uh, cleaning your gun barrels. Now, you'll notice by this time, there's Robin Hood's arrow. 
So this is one of the Italian characters of the American made ones. Okay? My grandfather was the guy who designed and made those, uh, all these SCMs. Right there. So this is center fire. Okay, that's where the, uh, the cap or the uh, primer goes right in the middle there. Okay? They were put in these huge boxes and then shipped all over the uh, all over the world. It's funny in terms of collectors. Uh, collectors uh, have they have a desire for these things, but they don't have the room. Everybody, uh, guys love these things. Their wives hate them. <laughs> <laughs> so generally, collectors do not have a lot of these things. They go for actually a lot less than they really should. And a bit, the thing that's really so bad about it is what people are doing now they're busting the, ca the cartridge cases apart and keeping just this. In a thousand years, people will uh, say that's absolutely horrible. You shouldn't do it. Okay? But, you know, what are you going to do with uh, 250 empty boxes like that? I guess we've got women here. <laughs> Okay, metallic cartridges now. So once again, uh, 22 caliber, uh, 32, and uh, 38 Smith and Wesson. At this point, they were not, not making 44 calibers yet. So there's the 22 caliber long uh, rim fire. Oh, this is important. Not very that I trust. Uh, in the early 20th century, all of the ammunition makers, uh, UMC, uh, Peters Cartridge Company, uh, and DuPont, and others, got together and formed a, uh, a conglomerate, not a conglomerate, uh, a alliance to fix the prices of gunpowder and cartridges. Uh, the goal of that was to force all the small companies out of business. Okay? Uh, Robin Hood was, uh, was approached, and they tried to uh, have Robin Hood join the uh, conglomerate, uh, and Robin Hood stayed out of it. Because uh, remember I told you there was a large Canadian connection, okay? Uh, and because of that connection, uh, they had no interest in uh, becoming you know, part of a, uh, a cartel. And so they were very proud of the fact that uh, I think U.S. Cartridge and them, uh, at this point in time, were the only two uh, that hadn't been eliminated by this, uh, this growing conglomerate. Comparative tests, very, very important. 22 caliber. They had made them both a slopus or a black powder. There's 32 caliber. Now, this is an interesting thing, and this is one that I wish I still had. Uh, they, in the old days, they used to make them with shotguns for pistols and stuff like that. Uh, the purpose uh, of that uh, was for burning. And so if you had a squirrel in the backyard you didn't like, you just take that and it would ricochet or anything like that. Like a wooden butt? Or a yes. Yeah. Yep, so all the, uh, the shot was in that wooden plug. And uh, when I yes, yeah. and so it would burst into just powder as it came out, and all the way it would go. So I've got tr trouble with uh, with chipmunks in our backyard. Here we go. It works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the interesting thing: these were shot with a spiral, you know, rifling, and so the whole thing would open up real wide. So uh, it wouldn't. It wouldn't, uh, you know, be very accurate, but it would, you know, at the distance from me, me to that door, uh, the shot pattern, you know, would be about eight feet in diameter. So you'd get it. You wouldn't kill it. You'd slow it down enough to go stop. <laughs> so these were, these were vermin cartridges, okay? So they get, they use them for rats and, in the city and, you know, get lost. Okay, now um, about 19, uh, this 1916, 
1906 is incorrect when I made this label up, okay? It actually is about uh, 1912, you know, later. I was not, not correct. Uh, the 44 caliber came in two different forms. Uh, they had the 44 caliber Winchester, and that is the uh, cartridge of the gun in the West. Very, very popular. It was used both in the Colt uh, Peacemaker pistol as well as the Winchester uh, 72 and uh, later the uh, Winchester uh, 92. Okay. So this is the one uh, that was used a lot in hunting, still quite popular. Okay. Now this one here is a fascinating, uh, fascinating cartridge. You notice it has a round ball uh, and it actually has a different powder. The center. This is made for a very rare, very interesting, and very exotic kind of a gun. Um, it's for the Marvel Game Gun. And there it is, right there. A little, forward, a little bit. Uh, this was the darndest thing. Okay, it did everything. Uh, it had, oh yeah, there it is. It had a big holster. The whole thing was about this one. Okay, fold the, uh, the stock, fold it under. It had a shotgun on the bottom and a rifle on the top. Now, you could uh, have uh, on the top was a 22 here, or you could have a 44 caliber or a 410 shotgun underneath it. So, uh, if, if you were going hunting, okay, this would be the perfect thing. Because you didn't know what you were going to find. If you saw a squirrel, pow. If you saw a deer, pow. So you could take anything. Oh. Yep. So uh, that was a really interesting thing. I, uh, my grandfather had one, and uh, I don't know where it went. Maybe I bought it. <laughs> you got one? All right, excellent. <laughs> so what, which ones do you have, the 44 or the 410 shotgun? Uh, 410. Okay. Uh, the 44? Uh, 410 was a 22 long rifle overhead. Yeah. 40 inch stock, they're illegal, because the stock is too long. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what it looks like up close. And um, it had uh, mar like marbles made their own gun sites. Uh, and everything. So the Robin Hood, uh, early on, developed uh, specific loads that were uh, developed for the game gun, so that it would not recoil uh, as much. So this was a very lightweight tool. It couldn't take a lot of. Uh, it was specifically made so you couldn't put a 44. Um, let me back up. You couldn't put this in, okay? Because this had a, a, a much larger uh, amount of powder in it. This is a much heavier bullet, and it would have blown the uh, uh, the game gun apart. And so that's why it had this round. So this would seat right here. So you couldn't get this longer one in. There's all kinds of technical things, uh, and Marvel and Robin Hood worked on on this to get this exactly right. So really kind of famous um, famous duo. Um, then once again, there's the smokeless powder. Now you notice later, it's not anywhere near as crazed. It's made by the Robin Hood Ammunition Company. Powder uh, company cans are all, always cracker. Uh, oftentimes, these are mostly just rusted. So this is the metallic cartridge line uh, around 1915. And all of this was made right in Swan. Okay? Huge production. And you can see, look at this. Kansas City. So they had distributors all over the United States. They had distributors in uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, and New Brunswick, and of course Quebec, uh, St. John, uh, and Nova Scotia, and Mexico City. And for that, okay. So, boy, they were—they're you know, all over the place. 
So they had, uh, you know, Smith and Wesson, so they had the Colt, including the, uh, the new automatic. This was a real problem uh, early on, uh, the automatic missiles. Uh, they would come up if you didn't have exactly the right type of power. Yes? I make the observation that this was distributed mostly by railroad? Yes. Yep. So we the railroad too. Absolutely. Probably in Mexico City, I bet it would have been easier to ship it by, uh, by freighter. Probably. But everybody else, of course, by rail. Now, this is my grandfather's uh, log book. This is the book that he used for all of his designing the cartridges. I want you to see this one, 3030 Winchester. He was in the process, see all these? This is his designs for making all the different dies that you need to take a slug of brass and turn it into a cartridge. Now, uh, Notice this, 3030 Winchester. All of these were ones that we have information that these were actually made by my grandfather. They are not existing in the, in the antique cartridge collecting trade at all. So there are some out there. I've got 3855 and I've got 3030. I've got those two. The only one, we have got some? I have. Okay. Do you have uh, from Robin Hood? Yep. Okay. Some like that mine, others are from Stone Yacht. They are very, very. Yep. But uh, according to my grandfather, they only made two runs of them. Uh, probably about uh, a thousand, uh, maybe less than a thousand. Because what happened is uh, World War I was breaking out. And they got. Uh, huge government contracts. It just stopped all this commercial manufacturing. Okay, so the World War One. Here we go. So you notice this is uh, 1915 here. We are compelled to temporary discontinue eclipse of blah 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 and all of this. Okay, so they cut way back on their cartridge manufacturer. That's Ed Funk there. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, they had, uh, we have some evidence uh, that they got a, uh, an order from the United States to be used with the uh, Winchester Rollwall uh, train uh, 22 short. This was the important uh, gun that was used uh, for practice uh, in the Army. So you uh, learn to shoot without having to uh, shoot big uh, you know, 30 out 6 cartridges. And so they got, uh, apparently, okay, this is just rumor and legend. Uh, they got a big grant, not a grant, but they got a big order from the feds for that. Uh, we also have some evidence of uh, 30 out six. Now, do you have any 30 out sections with the rubber hoods? Yeah. We don't have any other evidence uh, of the size or nature of the order at all. But the first orders were from the United States. Uh, but then it was eclipsed by uh, the order from France. Now, they, uh, in France, they were using. Uh, a gun that was called a label, a label, and these are different varieties. Uh, it used uh, the 8 millimeter uh, level of label, depends on the words you say in French or uh, or in Um <laughs> and they, uh, the French government ordered uh, 4 million cartridges. Okay. And so, by the, this time, uh, then he touched the American uh, orders. They got done with that, so they just focused entirely on uh, on this. Now the important thing is uh, that the level was associated uh, with the Hotch Hotchkiss. This is probably uh, one of the more uh, lethal and effective machine guns uh, that was developed during World War One. Uh, 
Now the problem, okay, that you had with these things was you had to make your cartridges uh, ex completely, uh, what should I say, uh, perfect from one to the next. There couldn't be any variation because in battle, if uh, one had more powder, less powder, uh, the bullet was seated too low, too high, or something like that. Uh, and a machine gun, you know, again, down the machine gun on the person who was using it, would then be a target and die. Okay? So the precision loading and the quality control had to be uh, immense in these. And so one of the new things that was added, I don't know whether I got this in the... No. Okay. Uh, one of the new things that was added was a uh, very scientific uh, way of measuring the speed of the bullets, the, uh, when they would be shot out of the, uh, the cars using a series of mirrors and flash, uh, and things like ways of being able to uh, determine that, uh, and measure the poundage uh, of the explosion, uh, the reliability. And they also set up a, uh, remember I showed you that uh, rifle range. They put a big cement block and they mounted hotchkiss at one end. And uh, there was uh, Captain Ben Slett uh, in Swamp. His uh, job was to shoot that gun uh, for eight hours a day, continuously. Ah, there. Yeah. Okay, and uh, that was, uh, and you had to uh, actually document what the misfire rate was. And if it, I think it had to be something like a complete misfire uh, every uh, 5,000 rounds or less. It had to be uh, that, or they wouldn't accept a whole lot. They had French inspectors, and then uh, the Russians ordered a bunch of these cartridges as well. And they sent a Russian inspector over. He was called Ivan the Terrible. <laughs> he had big boots, big um, you know, mustache. And weapon. Yep. And all of that. And uh, I guess the Cossack had boots for showing up the swamp. And my dad. So. Uh, but he was hell on wheels. Very much. He looked over everything. OK. Uh, the French inspector, Zélevi. <laughs> yeah, the Russian, yeah, so it was all the stereotypes that you could imagine, all in one place at one time. Uh, but uh, it was amazing, all the red tape. Uh, they had to add a whole office win to deal with the bureaucracy of all of this stuff. And so this, play, this is when they were making these, that's when they had all the traction running to, to St. Albans. This was a railroad town, but it was also uh, a, uh, a bedroom community for the Robin Hood. Okay, this was growing by leaps and bounds. Okay, this is the earliest, this is March 1960, Robin Hood. Okay, so here's your, uh, your orders. Lots and lots of uh, my grandfather was the one that designed all of this. So uh, his art, now uh, tool and die setting is an art. That's a form of sculpture. Okay, it's uh, considered so today. Uh, it's his art, uh, you know, that, that helped the uh, the Russian and the French class uh, during the World War. So I'm kind of proud of that. So that's the design right there. It's a very important, it's an exceedingly important historical document. <coughs> Interestingly enough, what page was written? I don't know. Now, anybody that knows uh, the way you have to keep a, a document like this, it all has to be done in ink. See, each page is numbered. And it's shown so that you can't take any information out of it. And if you add any information later, it has to be in pencil. So I don't know why, but something has gone out of there. Because this, these were actually, these could be subpoenaed. And these were legal court documents. Okay? So in other words, if this thing blew, my grandfather would have had to 
uh, provide this in a court case. And this is, this is a way to prevent uh, yourself from you know, perjury or screwing up the, uh, the data. discovered this little factory up here that had these huge contracts and they uh, they bought out uh, the original uh, owners of the uh, of the world. Now this is what it looked like uh, when it was around. Here. And this was a picture taken by Ben Brown, Swan historian, uh, interesting old college of when I was a kid. Uh, this is supposed to be the first aerial photograph in Vermont, at least according to Ben Brown. Uh, and an old biplane uh, that was barnstorming coming through the country. Uh, he hitched a ride, leaned over to that side, and shot a picture of, uh, of the revenue. So you can see once again, these are all those powder loaders here. Here's a rifle range. That's where my grandfather worked. Uh, there's the Interstate 89. Well, you can actually see it. See, there's heading north. So here, here it is in uh, 1917. See, testing. Now, this is the vacuum dryer. This is one of the few buildings that, when I was uh, a kid, uh, still existed. Uh, that was an artificial. Uh, drying the drying to dry the powder. Okay, after it was made. They had to dry it in very, very little heat. Um, and so that's still there. It was, uh, it's not there anymore. But. <coughs> okay. Now this is 1913-1916, uh, made by Remington UMC. So that's the date uh, when the shift over uh, started happening. At first they kept the raw hood. Uh, powder company, or excuse me, ammunition company, name, and then it, uh, it changed. 4, 17. Okay, now it's Remington Arms. But, yes, yep, there's one. So my grandfather made that one, and I've got that head stamp uh, in this old toolbox. <coughs> You can see here in 1860, UMC Swanton Works. That's what it was called. Union Metallic Cartridge Company. It actually bought out Remington. And uh, of course, now we don't know much about UMC. Now we all know Remington. So, really complex time. Everybody was buying and selling everybody else. This is uh, their mid stamp. The uh, plant closed in 1919. This is my grandfather's uh, letter of recommendation. Uh, so, uh, this is a testify that Mr. Fred Weisman has been in our employee for a number of years, basically from the second year it started, as a position of foreman of machine and tool, a mechanical and the equipment engineer, competent mechanic and faithful and energetic executive. It's here for your recommendation. Okay, now let's go back 
Remember uh, when Remington Yonsei bought out uh, Robert, they bought the big plant. They weren't interested in the power plant, and they weren't interested in the, uh, the old building next to the river. So uh, the original owners uh, decided uh, to keep those two buildings in terms of, that, in terms of the, uh, the selling out. They remain as uh, International Exclusion Company, right in the same building. Okay? Now, what they made uh, were primers and detonators. Basically, uh, the things that would, uh, are much larger uh, versions of, uh, of primers. Okay? These were for cannons, cannon shots. And so, uh, instead of a little teeny, you know, thing about this big, uh, the primers and detonators, depending on what size of a cannon show you were using, you know, would be up to that big, uh, quite large. And so they, they kept making uh, the fulminate down the powder run. They didn't make uh, powder anymore, okay? Uh, the powder was not made in Swan uh, after the uh, Remington uh, UMC bought them out. So the powder horn was specifically used only to make the, uh, uh, the fulminate. And there were some other uh, mercuric and uh, some other rare earth kinds of uh, detonators that were just being uh, pulled around with at the time. Is this, is this the building where the bridge is now? Yeah, the modern bridge is. Now, Smitty, is this a different building? Now, uh, because we're going to talk about what happened to this one. Is yes. that something towards Foundry Street? Yeah, Foundry Street's right behind it. These, were, these houses are on Foundry Street. You're going to East Alder. Yeah. March 17, uh, 1970, uh, the powder horn, not the powder horn, but the building uh, was racked by huge explosions. That killed three people. Ian Funk, who was uh, at one time the, uh, the assistant manager of the Robin Hood. Uh, Nellie Hemingway and Dora Savage. Uh, Nellie Hemingway is a relative of mine. Uh, and Dora Savage, both of these were uh, Swan Abenaki ladies. And they were, uh, they were killed in that explosion. Uh, March 28, 1918. Uh, two unnamed inspectors we don't know. Uh, that one destroyed the plant completely, level. Okay. Needless to say, uh, that building was gone. In 1921, uh, they were cleaning out uh, the powder arm. And uh, this was told to me by uh, Ed Gagne uh, of Swan, uh, back in about 1957. He said, uh, him and two other guys, they were, uh, they were cleaning it out under contract. And uh, they had a, uh, a, va a little vase of fulminate that they uh, had to get out of the building. And then they were going to burn it. And he said that uh, they, the guys that were helping him, uh, they uh, brought it out, they pumped it on the door. This is what was going out. And he said the explosion was, uh, was uh, amazing. He said, uh, I was blown so high into the air I could see Lake Champlain. I don't know what happened to the other two guys. They went, yeah. Yep. But, uh, you know, I was just a kid. And, you know, and hearing these stories, uh, and knowing where the powder horn is, and the size of the woods that are near to it, you had to go about 45 feet up to be able to see the lake. Where was the powder horn? On the McQuam Road, two-thirds of the way to the McQuam Shore from Swan. On the right hand side. No. And that is that. The end of it. So thank you very much.